Previously on Atomic Vision, DC, despite its attempts in the past to be faithful to comic book heritage, always seems to gain adulation when it moves away from the norms. There's more creative freedom in doing whatever you want than having to follow the source material by the book. And this, this right here is why Joker 2 might be DC's next big masterpiece. Hi, I'm your host Rob, and on this episode of Atomic Vision, I'm going to break down everything that went wrong with Joker Folia Du and how this highly anticipated sequel turned into DC's worst nightmare. Now if you're new to the channel, Atomic Vision is a show about film and television where I try to keep things fun and positive. I love entertainment, and with how weird nerd culture has gotten online, I always try to find the good in projects I either love or explain why some projects wasted their potential. That being said, Joker 2 enters new territory I never thought I'd cover here on the channel. Joker Folia Du isn't just a bad film because it's something I didn't enjoy. It's something far worse. It's a film that squanders all of its great ideas just to piss off the fans on purpose. In all my years watching comic book films, I have never seen anything like this before, and I can't believe that this film even exists. So I'm gonna try my best to break down everything fans hated about this film so you can see why I was so optimistic before and why every good idea went terribly, terribly wrong. <laughs> First things first, why is Joker 2 pissing off everybody? Originally, I was gonna talk about how this film subverts expectations, and trust me, we'll get to that later. But in a shocking turn of events, Variety has released a new article that finally reveals why this movie went to hell. When director Todd Phillips pitched the original Joker back in 2016, he truthfully never intended it to be based on a comic book character. But since he could never get his original idea greenlit, and I mean original very loosely here, he then dressed his old script with DC references to seal the deal with Warner. In the Variety article, some sources have said that if Joker 2019 had wiped away any and all DC references, the film would have been seen as an uneventful investment. Quote, if the first film was about some down-on-his-luck mentally ill guy in a downtrodden city, it makes maybe $150 million worldwide, not a billion. People only showed up because the guy was Joker. They don't give a shit about people like you, Arthur. And after Joker 2019 turned into DC's biggest success story, internally, Todd Phillips' antagonistic opinions were validated. People only care about these dumb superhero movies, and I hate that I have to make more of them. So when Warner came to him and said you are making a sequel, Todd took the opportunity to make a movie that puts the blame back on us, the audience. The Variety article claims that Todd Phillips refused to take any notes from DC's new CEOs, Gunn and Safran, because Joker 2 was not a DC movie in his eyes. It was a Warner Brothers movie. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Todd used any excuse he could to distance himself from the comic book company, dodging calls and meetings with Gunn. Uh, please hold. No, don't. And because his film earned over a billion dollars and an Oscar for Best Actor in 2019, Warner sided with Todd despite Gunn and Safran trying to support the filmmaker's vision. But to make matters even worse, Todd Phillips also chose to ignore Warner's notes as well. Allegedly, Zaslav, the CEO of Warner, had a meeting with Phillips and told him to make Joker 2 cheaper and in London. Todd declined and shot the sequel in Los Angeles for $190 million, nearly tripled the budget of the original film. Because Warner was certain that Joker 2 would be another slam dunk for the company, they refused to intervene and basically let Todd do whatever he wanted. I'm gonna make some weird shit. And if that wasn't a gigantic red flag already, Todd Phillips also refused to have any test screenings with audiences, which is a standard practice for any film being made in Hollywood. Even Warner Brothers had no clue if the film was successful and solely trusted Todd's judgment call. So just when you thought it couldn't get any more chaotic, Todd then forced Warner Brothers to screen the movie for the first time ever at the Venice Film Festival back in September. Quote, no one could get through to Todd. And the one thing about genre stuff, if you don't listen and pay attention to what the fans' expectations are, you are going to fail. Everything about Joker 2's catastrophic failure boils down to expectations, and we, the audience, all expected a different film than what was promised. Now oh, there goes that dream. 
Story-wise, the original film's ending sees Arthur sentenced to Arkham after murdering several people. So I wouldn't blame anyone for thinking that a sequel would be about Joker breaking out of the asylum so he could officially begin his full evolution into the clown prince of crime. He jokes on you. <laughs> But that didn't happen at all. In fact, Joker Fully Ado addresses this exact idea literally and tells the audience that it's stupid and will never happen. The movie is getting a ton of hate because of a frustratingly self-aware teardown of the 2019 film, where director Todd Phillips addresses all of the criticisms he received when making the first movie and then basically tells everyone to f off. Now I know I might sound hyperbolic, but what's crazy is that this is an actual plot point in the latest film, and it only gets weirder from here. Joker 2 takes ideas we all wanted and calls us dumb for expecting an actual follow-up storyline. And instead, Todd Phillips made Joker 2 a musical about how the Joker hates being the Joker. The film opens with an animated throwback to Looney Tunes that recaps the ending of the original movie while also retconning it to fit the sequel's new premise. The cartoon sees Joker's shadow causing all sorts of chaos, while Arthur himself is locked up in a wardrobe, basically a victim in this situation. Throughout the film, Joker testifies that he has a split personality disorder, and therefore, he didn't kill anyone. It was the Joker who did. No, it wasn't me. It was the one-armed man. While I totally understand what Todd Phillips is going for here, Unfortunately, this concept doesn't fully make any sense as the original film had zero hints toward Joker's split personality and feels like a tacked on detail to justify the film's dumb twist later on. After the animated recap, the actual film picks up where the last left off as Arthur is now in Arkham, awaiting his upcoming trial for the murder of six people. And as far as the first act goes, I'll be completely honest, the film was kind of working for me. It does a great job of setting up Harley Quinn in a way that makes sense and you get a great understanding of how this universe's Arkham works with its crooked guards and shitty psychiatry. It isn't until we get the first song that you can see where this film starts to nosedive. I know that my channel has mainly covered superhero films, but one of my favorite genres is musicals, with Singing in the Rain being my favorite movie musical. <laughs> so when I heard that Joker 2 was going to be a musical, I was pretty excited to see how they pull that off because the possibilities are truly endless. This is beyond messed up. You know, I should hate him, but damn it, the girl got moved. Sadly, Joker 2 isn't a real musical. It's just a movie where people sing cover songs at awkward times, and none of the set pieces feel grand or fantastical. But more importantly, none of the songs move the story forward. I honestly have no clue if Todd Phillips has actually seen a real musical before, because there are rules to how they are structured. Characters don't just burst into song, they do so to tell a story, or to get an emotion across that dialogue just can't do. But in Joker 2, they sing just because, and the song choices hold very little meaning. My next number, wind and rain and fire. <laughs> As Joker and Harley's romance blossoms, on top of a failed jailbreak from Arkham, the second act begins with Joker being interviewed by a news reporter played by Steve Coogan, and this is officially where the film starts to crater. The film attempts to weave musical numbers into casual conversations, and it just feels so unnecessary, on top of sounding really bad. Hallelujah, come on, get happy. Ready for the judgment day. But it wasn't until Joker's trial started that any compliments I had before began to vanish. Nearly every scene set in the courtroom feels overlong, uneventful, and straight up boring. But what makes this worse is how unbelievable these scenes are. Hollywood has a real hard time making courtroom drama feel realistic. But this script treats each courtroom scene like a circus, and no amount of lampshading can excuse it. When Arthur fires his lawyer and decides to represent himself in full clown makeup with a foghorn leghorn accent on top of it all, that's when the film jumped the shark for me. Shut up, Blum. Shut up! <laughs> Shut up with that Kentucky Fried Foghorn Leghorn drawl! While all these courtroom scenes have been boring up until this point, it's when Zazie Beat's character returns from the original film to testify against Joker that we get our first major retcon. As Sophie testifies, we learn that Arthur's mother had lied about every single thing and his dream to become a comedian was built on false hope just so he wouldn't kill himself. 
While this retcon is a bit messy and struggles to make sense, what makes this a terrible scene is the fact that we, the audience, are learning this new information from an outside character who is irrelevant to the story instead of seeing this for ourselves in the movie. Exposition dumping is a major crime in practically any film, but truthfully, they are the worst in superhero films. Holy f that is a sh ton of exposition. So to see Joker 2 so blatantly exposition dump and retcon all at the same time without actually showing anything just feels wrong, especially since the scene's purpose is to fully discredit the last film as a twist. But a few scenes later and a couple of bad songs sung, we get what I think is the one and only great moment throughout this entire film, and it's when Gary Puddles testifies against Arthur. I want to give a special shout out to actor Lee Gill, who genuinely kills it in this scene because he nearly makes the themes of this movie work. With this new sequel, Todd Phillips intended to retcon Joker into a false god, and every line of dialogue uttered by Gary Puddles is meant to showcase the damage Joker has caused to innocent characters like himself. The reason I love this scene, beyond Lee's acting, is that Todd's intentions of turning the original film into a cautionary tale almost works because it's the only moment where Arthur actually feels guilty. Sadly, this scene gets derailed immediately as Arthur reacts, blaming everyone else for his actions, including the guards at Arkham, which then leads to the darkest scene in the entire film. Arthur returns to Arkham after the trial, and because he humiliated the guards live on TV, in any other movie, it would typically lead to a scene where they torture and hurt Arthur as a means of venting their frustrations. But Todd Phillips takes it one step too far, and has the guards rip Joker. You just can't make this shit up. In the next scene, Joker is tossed into his jail cell, soaking wet, pantsless, with bruises all over his body, and from here on out, Arthur is a different character. When we return to the courtroom in a shocking turn of events, Arthur renounces the Joker title, admits that his split personality disorder was all a lie, and then pleads guilty to the murder of six people. The Arkham guards quite literally ripped the clown out of Joker, and I cannot believe that this is a real movie. As Arthur cries in the courtroom, ashamed of his crimes he committed, he then tells an anti-knock-knock joke, lampshading Arthur's lack of importance. Todd Phillips then kicks the audience while we're down by giving us one last major set piece which sees a bomb going off in the courtroom, allowing Arthur the opportunity to escape. It is then revealed that the Joker's acolytes are the ones responsible for the bomb and are here to rescue him. But in a cruel twist, Todd Phillips reminds us again that the film audiences really want is not going to happen. So Arthur escapes from his rescuers and returns to the iconic staircase from the original film as he waits for the police to arrive. The final closing scene is the worst scene of them all, as Arthur sits in Arkham, is then called into a hallway by a guard, and then is stabbed to death by an Arkham inmate who is revealed to be the real Joker. Wait, what? Arthur bleeds out in the hallway as the actual Joker laughs in the background before the screen cuts to black. Now if you made it this far into the video, you may have noticed I left Lee out of this breakdown, and I did that for good reason. When Lady Gaga was first cast as Harleen Quinzel, every single one of us was expecting the iconic mad love storyline but told with a realistic twist. However, Lee's journey in this film is symbolically meant to represent us, the audience. Lee is a Joker fanatic who is so obsessed with his turn to crime, she gets herself sent to Arkham just to be with him. Throughout the film, she never calls Arthur by his name, only referring to him as the Joker, and all of the imaginary musical numbers are the only times we see Harley and Joker together like we've wanted. As the film goes on, Lee slowly transforms into Harley Quinn, outfit and all, and when Arthur rejects being the Joker in his final courtroom scene, Harley is pissed. Todd Phillips literally made a movie in which the audience is dissatisfied with Joker, and when Harley Quinn rejects Joker on the staircase at the end of the film, it is meant to represent the audience turning their back on the movie. Joker Folia Du was meant to upset us on purpose because he was annoyed that audiences actually enjoyed his original film, so he wanted to set the record straight that Arthur is a bad guy by taking away all of his power, including his title as Joker. But now the question is, was it worth it? And the answer is no. Is it cool that two Joker films were never about the actual Joker? Not really. Is it cool knowing that the actual Joker at the end of the film is just a poser who stole some other guy's clown gimmick? Also no. And was having the film be a musical and courtroom drama necessary? No and no. 
While the film is gorgeously shot, with great performances from Lady Gaga and Lee Gill, the sequel didn't need to exist, let alone one told this way. Joker Folia Du isn't brave for subverting expectations, changing film genres, or retconning the previous film for new plot twists. It's a film made out of spite to enrage the audience and to satisfy no one. And what really drives me crazy is that the film itself even forgot about its Looney Tune motif at the beginning. If your cartoon has an opening title card, it must have a closing title card. And the original Joker film did exactly that. This newest film forgets all about that, leaving the audience just to stare at Arthur's dead body with no sense of actual closure, and I think that's awfully poetic. That's the end. Doesn't have to be a whole big thing every single time. You know, that's life. That's just sort of how, how shit goes. <laughs> Sometimes things just sort of end. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode of Atomic Vision, leave a like, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.